Welcome, everybody. I know we still have people filing in, but I think we'll get started. Welcome all of you to the uh, HMEI faculty seminar series for this month. My name is Mike Celia, and I'm the director of Princeton's High Meadows Environmental Institute. As most of you probably know by now, we offer this seminar series the first Tuesday of each month, where the speakers are prominent uh, Princeton faculty members uh, that uh, we choose from across the university. Uh, we have two more left for this semester. Next month, we'll hear from Allison Carruth, uh, one of our newest HMEI faculty members. And in May, we'll hear from Reed Maxwell, uh, another new HMEI faculty member. Uh, as a reminder, as we've done uh, since we went uh, to this remote format, we invite uh, all of the audience members to submit questions or comments using the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your screen. You can do that anytime during the talk. Uh, please note that the chat function is disabled for participants. And uh, just as a, a note, this lecture is being recorded. Today's speaker uh, is V. Ram Ramaswamy, and our discussant today is Gabe Vecchi. I'll say a few words about Gabe when I introduce him after Ram's talk. I have a great pleasure now to, to introduce our speaker, uh, who is our good friend, Ram. He is the director of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, or GFDL, which is a NOAA, which means National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, laboratory located on Princeton's Forestal campus, not far from the main campus uh, where uh, I'm currently sitting. Ram is also a faculty member in the Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences program in the Department of Geosciences here at Princeton. Ram has provided great leadership at GFDL for more than a decade now. Under his leadership, GFDL has moved into a new era of supercomputing as the lab continues to build world leading earth system and climate models. In his own research, Ram has focused on many aspects of the climate system, including radiative transfer models, as well as, as aspects of the hydrologic cycle, especially its atmospheric component. Ram has received uh, many awards. I'll mention a few of them. He's an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the uh, American Meteorological Society. He's been the lead author on major IPCC reports. He was the AMS Walter Orr Roberts Lecturer in Interdisciplinary Sciences, as well as the Bert Boleyn Lecturer at Stockholm University. He's the recipient of the AMS Henry G. Houghton Award. He has been uh, uh, named as the Sir Gilbert Walker Distinguished Professor at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi, IIT Delhi. And he is a recipient of the US Presidential Rank Award, as well as many other government uh, awards from NOAA, from the Department of Commerce, and other agencies within the government. Ram has been a great partner for us here in HMEI, and indeed across the entire Princeton campus. So uh, please join me in giving a very big virtual welcome to our great friend, Ram Ramaswamy. Ram, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Mike. I hope everyone can hear me and, uh, and see me. Uh, it's a really a pleasure to uh, give this uh, seminar uh, at the new High Meadows Environmental Institute. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you uh, very much to everyone who's organizing this. Uh, including Gabe, uh, who's going to come afterwards. So let me begin sharing my screen. And okay. All right. I hope everyone can uh, see my screen and uh, hear me. Uh, the Today's seminar, I wanted to touch upon uh, some of the, what I would call multi-scale uh, research that has to go on towards uh, the scientific understanding of the climate and earth system, and then leading to predictions and uh, projections uh, of, uh, of the earth system. So we have to first define what an earth system is. Uh, it kind of, you can define it in different ways, but this is kind of our big conceptual uh, picture. Uh, of the Earth system. Uh, and now we are kind of in the fourth generation in terms of Earth system modeling at GFDL. 
Uh, it consists of the atmosphere, oceans, cryosphere, biosphere, and marine and terrestrial ecosystems. What, so just, you know, before I begin to talk about some uh, details, I just want to show you this picture of what the scope is. And uh, if you look from the, uh, oops, if you look, I don't know why I skipped there. So if you look from uh, the uh, top left to right, you have the atmosphere containing clouds, transport of aerosols such as dust, uh, atmosphere ocean interactions such, such, as, such as the El Nino phenomenon, and then interaction between land and atmosphere, then uh, ecosystems along the coastline, eddies in the ocean, which are very fine scale uh, features uh, to understand the ocean circulation, and then marine ecosystem, uh, which kind of uh, suffer the consequence of any climate change. So these are kind of the broad scale phenomena that we're investigating with the modeling uh, that we do at uh, GFTL, and which is in, obviously in collaboration with uh, a lot of folks at Princeton, uh, the geosciences department, and then uh, the High, High Meadows Environmental Institute, uh, water resource, civil engineering, uh, the, the uh, School of Economics, and, and so on. And there's a lot of schools that, that the interactions go along with. So in terms of just giving you a schematic of what the uh, Earth's, what do you mean by Earth system in terms of actual processes that go into it. So you see here, uh, starting from the top, the atmospheric dynamics and physics, and then atmospheric chemistry involving both the stratosphere and the troposphere. Uh, and then uh, a number of processes involving both online em emissions uh, and then aerosol cloud interactions and involving things like transport and deposition of aerosols. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you see the forcing elements, solar radiation, volcanic aerosols, and then a bunch of ozone depleting substances, uh, concentrations of gases, uh, and then precursor emissions such as uh, fire, ships, aircraft. And then at the bottom, you see the land model, a uh, very complex land model, which actually is dynamic and interacts with the uh, weather and climate system. And then an ocean model uh, popularly called MOM6 uh, and which has biogeochemistry modules attached to it so that you can actually then engage the climate um, uh, ecosystem uh, interactions. So um, multi-scale, I had that in the title and uh, Frankly, I, I kind of didn't know what I was going to talk about, but there are actually a lot of things that you can think of as being multi-scale in, in the context of climate earth system. I'm just going to touch upon a few examples, but they are by no means exhaustive. There's, there's a lot of examples you can, you can uh, give on the multi-scale challenges. So I'm going to take an example of aerosols. And, and the thing about aerosols is they are very small, of course, some micron sizes, but they have large scale impacts. And so the processes, you know, in terms of very, in terms of the physics of the problem, goes from emissions to the microphysics of aerosols to the transformation and transport in the atmosphere, and then eventually deposition over land and oceans. Uh, the optics of aerosols uh, they they scatter light and affect the radiation balance, which then starts to affect the heat balance of the system, eventually uh, morphing into circulation changes, then ultimately resulting in climate impacts. So let me go over a little bit uh, into this example. So this is a schematic of how in a model you're treating the various processes. So assuming that you have emissions from the ground, uh, you have advection, so they move about, the aerosols move about. And then there's growth of aerosols because of the uh, water vapor in the atmosphere and humidification conditions. And some of the aerosols can absorb radiation, some uh, reflect radiation. Um, and so that's in the sort of skies without clouds. And then when you get to the cloudy skies, you have this interaction between aerosol and cloud droplets. And there, therein is a scale problem right away because the aerosols are much smaller than cloud droplets, but yet um, that interaction is very consequential. And that also interacts with the radiative transfer to alter the heat balance in the atmosphere. Now, in terms of the, so one of the things I wanna come, come, come to is the uncertainty about aerosols and what it results in, in terms of climate uh, uncertainties. So one of the things in the assessments, and this is the Inter uh, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change Assessments, uh, if you see the, at the bottom, the, the bars are how uh, things have evolved uh, going from sort of bottom to up, the, uh, the third assessment report, fourth assessment report, and the fifth assessment report. And you know, even though we have a lot of years between assessments, the uncertainty in the aerosol forcing of climate is very large. 
it's mostly negative because aerosols at, as a net reflect sunlight. But the uncertainty is very large and this what then culminates in the uncertainty in climate impacts. Now the aerosols, unlike you know, greenhouse gases like CO2, methane, N2O, are composed of several different types, nitrate, dust, organic aerosols, biomass burning, black carbon, sulfate, of which black carbon is the only one which is totally absorbing or very certainly absorbing. The others are mostly, mostly reflecting. And this is the, and, and because of their, they are spatially heterogeneous, this is kind of what confounds our understanding of the climate problem. And then to further sort of illustrate this uh, scale uh, issue, uh, you have aerosols here, which are very small. And then you have these clouds and you can see the dimensions here, 50 to 100 kilometer for the entire, let's say convection and cloud activity. And then of course the vertical, you're going up uh, to about the tropopause, 15 kilometers. So this scale is something that is uh, very difficult to cover because sometimes you actually have knowledge gaps in how, for example, scavenging and then uh, ice nucleation are taking place. Uh, nevertheless, the modeling is being done. As you can see, a lot of studies have kind of over the years have uh, indulged the modeling. Uh, and so does GFTL as part of the climate system. Now, one uh, way to uh, look at the complexity is this is actually a satellite image of, uh, of, um, of Africa. A lot of fires happening. The red dots are all fires which are happening. And so there's biomass burning. And as this, as this uh, plume comes out over land and, and eventually the ocean, you see how the planetary albedo, which is the amount of light reflected, actually is decreasing when it's over a cloud, but increases when the aerosol plume comes over the ocean. So one has to take uh, account of this, uh, you know, scale differences that happen. We do that. And so we run a model. And one of the things about modeling is uh, in a very kind of succinct sense, a model is a tool that you can exploit to understand and pose various questions. So for example, in this uh, run that you see of the 20th century surface temperature change uh, with, the, with the GFDL model CM3, which was uh, in 2013, uh, over the last uh, 150 years, uh, you see that the red line is what would happen to the surface temperature if only greenhouse gas were increasing. The brown line, if it's only the aerosols were changing over time. So you can see one is positive, there's a positive anomaly, one is a negative anomaly. And then there's a natural one, which is volcanoes and solar radiance. That's practically inconsequential in terms of the changes over the 20th century. So when you put them all together and have the combined response to all the four things, then you get this blue line. And so you can see the blue line is a striking sort of offset between the red and the brown line. And this is an important aspect of the aerosols. They actually cool down relative to the greenhouse gases. So you have less warming when you have aerosols present. The actual observed is the black line. And you can see that the model uh, does a fair job, but not exactly an accurate job in terms of reproducing 20th century temperature. I want to get to sort of another aspect, which uh, I got to kind of uh, explain really rudimentarily, but uh, it's actually a very important aspect of aerosols, which is the influence on global precipitation. So this is analogous to the surface temperature change, excepting that you see, if you, if you look follow the black line here, you see that, the, that because of the aerosol, there's actually a dip between about 1960 and uh, 1980 in this particular model run, where the precipitation, the global mean precipitation actually decreased. And then it starts to increase again because in the 21st century, there's gonna be a draw, drawdown of aerosols while greenhouse gases are gonna to continue to increase. And the reason why the aerosol induced uh, changes occur in precipitation, which is very significant, is because of the fact that they reduce the, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a short, Explanation sense they reduce the sunlight reaching the surface and they reduce the vigor of the hydrologic cycle, so you decrease precipitation. And in fact, we have three, two different models. CM3 came in 2013, CM4 is our latest model, and both of them show the decrease of the CM4 because of lesser aerosol forcing in the model actually has a less, less decrease than the uh, CM3. But nevertheless, the aerosols have this influence despite the uncertainty. This is kind of what the aerosols do. Uh, relative to, for example, greenhouse gases. So this becomes a very important aspect of the um, multi-scale problem and also trying to resolve this uh, central uncertainty in uh, climate change. Um, let me now go into other uh, ways of thinking about multi-scale in the Earth system, which is the different components themselves. They all have different equations governing them. So they uh, have different features. So first of all, I want to talk about 
uh, this uh, finite volume cube sphere dynamical core. It's basically the equations that drive the atmospheric circulation in the model. And this FV3, which was uh, formulated in, at GFTL over the last uh, 10 years, and culminating finally in it being selected as the core for the weather uh, service forecast system. And in fact, from June 2019, all the forecasts you see, operational forecasts, actually have this FV3 die core from GFTL. One of the beauties of the FV3 is it connects global and regional phenomena, such as you see here, depicted here, uh, very nicely, so that it actually allows us to, to transcend the, the scale problem, at least in terms of the dynamics and being able to capture in a consistent manner. One of the examples I'll show here is, the, is it's used in the context of hurricane forecasts. And uh, what this uh, plot is showing is the mean track error versus forecast hour for two hurricanes, Laura and Marco, which were very recent. Uh, and start, 120 hours means starting on five days and then you're going down to zero days, which is current. So you can see that the weather service model, the latest one actually uh, has a significantly reduced track error relative to other models. But the GFTL model, which is a little bit different now from the weather service model is actually giving an even lesser uh, track error. And then intensity error also is reduced in this model from five days out. And of course, as you come closer to pres the present, then uh, uh, you know, all the forecasts do get better. So this is one use of the uh, modeling at GFTL where better modeling as well as better initialization has led to the prospect of better and earlier forecasts. Now, going off from there, we ha have a three kilometers resolution model, which can't run on climate time scales yet because it's very expensive to run. But I'm showing you a snapshot of a run, uh, which on the left-hand side is the model run. And on the right-hand side is a satellite run at uh, zooming in on approximately the same day. And you can see that the circulation and what you're seeing actually is uh, the brightness. So it's the clouds that you're seeing. Uh, you see the circulation and the spin and the spinning up of, the, of, the, uh, of these cloud circuit systems uh, very much comparable to the satellite at three kilometers. So this is actually, uh, and I'm gonna show you a movie at the end of this, it's actually revolutionary in the sense that we can actually now think of going down to doing things at three kilometers. Only, only problem is the computing uh, is not there yet. Um, and a very recent example is the COVID-19 emission reduction impacts with these atmospheric models, where for example, the aerosol optical depth, which is a measure of the amount of uh, aerosol in the atmosphere and their properties, um, and this is the solar radiation budget. And you see, as you come towards uh, March, April of 2020, that the, the, mo the observations, uh, the model is, uh, is kind of strikingly different from the observations in both optical depth and the flux, solar reflected flux. And what this is saying is that the emission reductions have actually caused a decrease in the amount of aerosols and also caused a decrease in the solar radiation budget. So this is a wonderful, uh, compares with observations and trying to get the trying to get to assess the quality of the model uh, very well. Um, getting to the oceans, there are similar things happening in the oceans. This is again a schematic of all the things that actually go into the ocean model, MOM six at GFTL, which is being now which is now being used at uh, NASA Weather Service, NCAR, so on. Uh, you know, all the way from bottom topographic interactions and mixing, subduction, uh, near surface shears, Ekman transport. Uh, internal bay radiation and then mesoscale uh, eddy, eddy stirring. This is all uh, some. This is all I think incorporation of scales in the ocean, and it's a sort of the analog of kind of what is being taken care of and accounted for in, in on the atmospheric side. And then not to uh, you know leave this uh, uh, this this point aside. Uh, increasingly, we are going to the regional modeling of the oceans because and what you see is here is of course the entire east east coast. Uh, uh, eddies that, uh, that, that are carrying heat and salt. This is very important, uh, both in terms of the context of the weather forecast, as well as climate predictions, and also for the near coastal uh, interactions involving both uh, the ocean water, uh, as well as the, uh, the nutrients and the biogeochemistry uh, occurring in the coastal waters. So again, this is a very recent uh, development that is just starting to happen using the MOM6, the the, the version, which is a global ocean. Um, on the land too, there is a lot of uh, scaling that one has to uh, account for. Uh, you know, you look at some of the parameters here, the leaf area index runoff, evaporation soil moisture, uh, and then slope, sloping, and then um, capturing the environmental data 
which is on much finer resolution into the model. So again, uh, a different scaling problem, but again, uh, something that has to be uh, accounted for. Um, so I want to kind of jump to some of one of the philosophies that we have in modeling, which is uh, you kind of, think, kind of think of kind of can think of three axes: complexity of the processes, resolution. You obviously want to get the best complexity, account for the complexity, account for the resolution, and then simulation time, depending on the uh, weather forecasts or climate simulations, and then quantifying the uncertainties and and also. Uh, realism, that's kind of important uh, in, in these models uh, in order to apply them to practical problems. And obviously one of the quests, uh, you know, for the GFTL models is to actually get down to uh, capturing these uh, disruptive events and the losses from them by uh, doing the forecasts earlier, better, uh, which includes things like location, severity, duration of phenomena. Uh, one of the things that becomes important is the fidelity of the models. And uh, I'm just going to go to this uh, thing marked in red box. Over the years, from 2005, this model was in 2005, this 2013, this is 2019, you can see the reduction in the error in precipitation, which is crucially important in terms of the energetics and the water cycle in, uh, that you model. So the fact that it's com coming down because of uh, improvements in modeling is a uh, very uh, very heartwarming thing. Another thing is resolution. And here, what you see is capturing the precipitation of North America with the increased resolution. So this is the observation. This is what you want to capture. This is a model in about 2005. So you can see uh, the coarseness here. And then you have um, the model in 2014, uh, getting sh the features are getting sharper. And ultimately, when you go to even high resolution, the features get sharper and sharper, including sort of capturing the precipitation peak in the Southeast, which is uh, uh, reflected in the observations. So using this model as a basis, uh, we dare to go and project and predict. And one of the things now that uh, is being looked on is the weather climate interface. Uh, so weather climate interface means, so this is actually the daily sea level anomaly. And let's take New York here. Uh, what you see in blue is the unperturbed climate. What you see in red is the doubling of CO2. And, and what, and what the, the horizontal lines are like one in 100 years, one in 10 years. But you see the daily excursions have happening in both the one times and two times CO2 cases. But, but and you see a clear separation emerging after about 60, 70 years of the CO2 increase. Um, so, but you still have excursions, for example, in, in the one perturbed case, which can actually be uh, as much as what you see in the CO2 case. New Orleans is a sort of a really a classic example of where because of the weather storms coming frequently, you have even in the blue case, uh, excursions which kind of, you know, go as high as the one in 100 year model. So even natural variations have a big effect on the uh, daily sea level anomaly in New Orleans. Um, this is sort of a very recent paper where um, the, the point of this paper was this, that uh, you have the global mean surface temperature, which is depicted in the top panel here. The observations are in black and the model simulation that you want to look at is a red one. So the global mean surface temperature over the last 180 years, 100 years is actually captured very well. Uh, but the observed trend in tropical cyclone frequency looks like this. This is a blue means less and red means more. Uh, the annual global tropical cyclone number uh, has actually not changed much, despite the fact that category, severe category of hurricanes has increased, a tropical global uh, number in cyclones hasn't changed. And the model simulations now actually show that you can actually capture this, namely both the increase in sea surface temperature, but the distribution of different kinds of frequencies along the globe. So if you compare with the observed tropical cyclone frequency, you see that a lot of features are replicated, including the decrease in this part, uh, sorry, increase in this part and increase in the Atlantic and then decrease in these parts and a decrease in the Southern Hemisphere. Again, giving us confidence that uh, even predictions with these models are, uh, are, are good to, to begin with. Another compares the observations is the snowpack in Western US predicted on July 1st of each year for the following year. So this is the spring time snowpack. Uh, on the left is predicted, on the right is observed. And you can see that uh, a, a, a sort of a, at least qualitatively, and even maybe quantitatively too, a lot of features are captured extremely well uh, by these predictions. 
Uh, similarly, with the Arctic summer sea ice extent, uh, the black is observations and the GFT Earl prediction, which is actually done uh, given in April for the September of that following year, is capturing the variability and anchorings rather well with, with the modeling system. And then I'll get to the uh, linkages of the models to atmospheric chemistry and ecosystems, which is kind of as important as the uh, temperature and precipitation aspects. Uh, first, uh, looking at uh, continental scale heat waves, this is over the US, and the top panel is showing the surface temperature between model and observation. Now, this is over a 30 year period. Uh, I believe it went from 1984 to 2012. Uh, and you see kind of the capturing of the uh, peaks in surface temperature, approximately the right place uh, compared to observations. And accompanying that is a precipitation deficit, which is uh, shown in brown, uh, slightly more extended in terms of spread uh, in, the, in the model, but nevertheless approximately capturing the region. Now with this as basis, uh, uh, what is predicted is the, um, the uh, heat waves, which is, has a particular definition, but is a convolution of duration and number of events per year in different parts of the US. So a num this is a ratio in uh, 2041 and 2070 compared to 71 and 2000. You can see that everywhere, along, you know, all these regions exceed, uh, exceed by at least three. So three times more heat waves or up to six times more heat waves uh, if you go to the, uh, uh, the upper Midwest and, and further West. So again, same model, this is kind of not a different model, it's the same model that's producing uh, these kind of results. Now, along with the summer heat waves, there's another quantity that is uh, important, which is the air quality, uh, basically buildup of tropospheric ozone among other pollutants uh, at the ground level because of the heat waves, because of the chemistry that occurs. And this is actually a particular, um, uh, looking at the particular set of uh, observations, measurements, done at Penn State University, so pretty close to where we are. Um, and the, um, the uh, observation observed tropospheric ozone is in black, which is kind of these dots. Uh, and the gray is the uh, temperature maximum. So that's on the right-hand side. And so you can see a lot of years between 1980 and 2015 when the peaks were hit. And then the purple is the simulation by a model with interactive atmospheric chemistry uh, and trying to simulate the observed tropospheric ozone. By and large, it's actually pretty good considering a lot of uncertainties uh, in the models. Uh, and this, in fact, this particular peak was also predicted uh, by the GFTL model uh, initialized on June 1. So uh, both the temperature simulation or the prediction uh, and the concurrent uh, ozone were mapped pretty well uh, with respect to observations. Again, giving a clue to the, the fact that the model can link up with chemistry and then the physical system and the chemical system can be uh, linked pretty well. Um, and then another aspect of the earth system is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, combining the, uh, or uh, linking the uh, biogeochemistry to the physical model and on the left side, what you see is a prediction of uh, chlorophyll. This is a, so this red means perfect prediction. So you, what you see here is a good predictability in a lot of places uh, in the world's oceans and, there are, and then separate ocean basins are captured below. But what is even more interesting is that in, se in uh, different field investigations, they're actually capturing even other things like oxygen. So this is kind of, capturing of oxygen, the black line is ob observation, the red line is a zero to one year prediction, and the green is one to two year prediction. So this is a, you know, a more than a year in advance, you're, you're able to predict the oxygen. This was in California ocean current. And then at the bottom six panels uh, actually depict the mean fish catch reported and predicted. Reported is in black, predicted is in green and red. And again, you know, for a first of its kind, this was actually a very good indication that the goodness of the physical model actually then uh, translates into some nice results in the marine ecosystem uh, predictions. So um, what, what, I mean, I want to summarize here now, uh, where we are coming to is uh, back in 2012, the National Research Council had a recommendation that to modeling centers, both weather and climate modeling centers, that uh, unified modeling approaches are the way to go, which was, uh, you have to realize that this is actually a very difficult task because weather and climate models, 
you know, prior to 2010 have proceeded rather differently because of different requirements. And it's like, you know, when, when shall the twain meet? Uh, what uh, now we believe is that that is possible now, the twain is meeting. Um, and that with the, uh, with the system that uh, we have, the modeling framework we have set up, that this is indeed not only possible, but uh, can be a deployed for practical applications, and which is what we are doing. So in this, you have to capture a lot of things. You have to capture the internal variability, which is due to natural variations. You have to capture the changes due to external forcings. Uh, you have to ca capture extremes, which is kind of very important in when you're looking at societal relevance. And then there's a whole slew of uh, phenomena and drivers and uh, events that uh, a model has to capture in order for it to be regarded as uh, credible. And one of the things in this bridging of the weather to climate in terms of seamless framework is the fact that now we can go and do events all the way from weather to uh, you know, decadal to multi-decadal to centennial uh, timescales. Um, and this is, uh, NOAA puts out the information uh, to a lot of sectors. Some of them are, are depicted here. Uh, and there are different sectors want different kinds of information, but uh, the, 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 the results that uh, we produce are actually, are actually uh, disseminated through, by NOAA through to uh, various agencies. And in fact, um, there is now a great degree of interest in the fact that high spatial resolution models can tackle uh, events from all the way from uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal to interannual to decadal to multi-decadal time scales. Um, a lot of interest coming from customers and stakeholders for this kind of information uh, to link up to their to their particular sector's importance. And I'll finally end with this uh, with this sort of animation, uh, which is as I as I as I showed a picture earlier of the three, three kilometer model, uh, comparing it, uh, to the com comparing it to the satellite observations. This is actually that three kilometer model. Uh, we are able to run it for about a, a season or slightly more, not yet on climate time scales because of computing uh, limitations. But what you see is all the fine scale features that are happening in the atmosphere at the three kilometer, at the, you know, at the one to three kilometer level. Uh, and this is actually portends very well for capturing of a lot of the event, a lot of the extremes because extremes, some of the extremes, for example, hurricanes depend upon how well you can capture the, uh, the spinning motions, et cetera. So this is, uh, this is actually a very, very um, critical development. And the next thing after this, we're gonna do is actually create a couple model, which also is, uh, you know, has a very high resolution. Right now, the highest resolution uh, that we can run a couple model at is 25 kilometer in the atmosphere, but that is, destined to go even higher as we uh, employ um, more innovative modeling techniques to actually jump the scale. So I will end there um, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike or is it Gabe? I think Gabe? it's going to, going to be me and then Gabe. It's a, a, a bit of a quick handoff and then another one. Anyway, thank you, Ron. Thank you, That's Mike. a fantastic talk. Um, so now I just want to uh, uh, actually turn the screen over to our discussant, Gabe Vecchi. Gabe is a professor of geosciences and also jointly appointment in, appointed in our institute, HMEI. Among the many things he does, he's the director of the Cooperative Institute for Modeling the Earth System, CIMES. He's an expert on climate modeling, uh, and he wears many hats. Uh, he's, he, he works on extreme weather events, including hurricanes, also works on detection and attribution studies related to climate change and a variety of other things. But Gabe, for now, I'll turn it over to you to begin the Q&A. Thanks. Um, oh, thank you, Mike, but, and especially thank you, Ram. Uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and we have a fair deal of interest. A number of questions have popped up. And so rather than uh, interject with my own, I will, um, start with a, uh, I'm gonna group a couple questions uh, by, from Alan Robach together. Um, they regard sort of the level of simulation that is explicitly done in some of the models that you showed. Um, so there's questions about to what extent are fires explicitly simulated rather than prescribed? And similarly with crops, to what extent are, uh, is the evolution of the crop simulated and to what extent is that a prescribed aspect of the models? So let me take the fires first. Um, 
fires are uh, there. There is actually uh, a mechanism or you know thing formalism put in to initiate fires, which kind of in the Earth system model uh, depends on things like the capacity or what's the fuel capacity of the of the vegetation, and, and then uh, in, initiation by lightning, uh, which is of, of course not you know don't create lightning in the model, but you actually use uh, uh, convection uh, or some features associated with convection to trigger lightning. Um, and I have, I, I kind of want to quote the example. I, I didn't put it in because of uh, you know time, but uh, there is actually a paper that uh, has come out on the Alaskan fires uh, using a model. Uh, so the Earth system model actually has been able to simulate the propensity for the increase in Alaskan wildfires in the recent years uh, because of the fact that the, because of warming, and then it's actually creating the increase in the capacity of the, of the vegetation to acquire the fuel to burn. So it's actually a pretty, pretty nice comparison. Uh, I'd be happy to share that paper with you. It uh, came out, no, it's actually gonna come out this uh, early this year, it's been accepted, but it shows very nicely the, um, uh, with the model, of course, you can go back 100 years and do it. And you kind of see the model that the uh, this sort of uh, capacity increases as you approach 2000, uh, year 2000, and then it, it keeps increasing. Um, on the other hand, of course, observations go only, third, I think, 20 years. So you can't really compare like a pre-industrial to present, but you can actually see that the amplitude that the model has right now is pretty comparable to where the observations are for the last 20 years. So. Uh, we haven't, we, the next thing is to capture the California fires. We haven't kind of quite done that yet, but Alaskan fires certainly gives us the opening that the model can be tested for the California fires too. On crops, this is a dynamic vegetation. So the vegetation is interacting. Uh, now I am, I have to kind of go to my land specialist to ask uh, what, to what level of granularity the crops are simulated. But in a broad sense, uh, you know, because of the different, the, the tile, tiling system that exists and capturing heterogeneity, uh, I, I would have to believe that to a large extent, a lot of the, a lot of the different types of vegetation are being captured. So, uh, Ram, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of expand a little bit on on uh, sort of riff off these questions before going on to some new ones. But uh, could you just briefly discuss the type of thinking and the trade offs uh, that the modeling center has to go through? in order to determine which aspects of the Earth system are explicitly simulated relative to which aspects are uh, more prescribed. And then there's the middle section where you parameterize. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very challenging question. I mean, I think, you know, this is always a tough thing. Um, our emphasis has been on the integrative aspects of the modeling. So, you know, you can actually, so the, I showed you the three axes, complexity, resolution, and then the number of years of simulation. The complexity resolution is very important because there is a trade-off. You cannot go to extremely complicated in the atmosphere, for example, um, and then not be able to run the model because you have increased complexity so much. Same goes with resolution. You can actually, you know, if you want to, you can go down and try three kilometers, but you can't run a climate model uh, with that resolution in the atmosphere. So it's always a trade-off. But I think, you know, ultimately what, uh, at GFDL, the mantra always has been over the years, over the decades, that you build a math the ma model is a mathematical tool. So you're building the tool to address problems. And so you're always going to have to keep that in mind and not go off, you know, expanding, to, you know, into infinity in one direction, because then you can't do the problem. So it's, it's always a matter, I mean, and there are always sort of regrets later on that, hey, you know, if I run the resolution to have to, you know, finer than this, uh, I would have gotten, you know, better results out of it. That, um, but that then triggers the next set of model development. You know, it's a motivation for the next model development. How can I get to even more resolution? But I have to say one of the things that has enabled us to go even this far in resolution, when most of the IPCC models, you know, most of the modeling centers typically have their models at really 100 kilometers and even 50 kilometers, even for IPCC runs, we do 50 kilometers. But to be able to go to then 25 kilometers is, is a big, big boon. And, you know, as, you know, Gabe will recall, I mean, that uh, with the 25 kilometer model, certain features became so evident that that sparked, uh, you know, more motivation to do a lot of things. And then when you find not just hurricanes, but, 
you find you know arctic uh, sea ice extent you find uh, you know heat waves etc all mapping out very nicely uh, with these uh, even 50 km 25 km resolutions uh, that that you know gives us a lot of hope but then you know you can't take that and say immediately that okay i'm going to now go to a 2 km climate model it isn't possible so we have to do with whatever i mean that will always happen no matter we get the fastest computer ever we'll still be left you know uh, not doing everything per as perfectly as we would wish so that that brings us perfectly to uh, a question that Michelle Liu has for us uh, which is that there's a lot of success stories and and uh, that you've shown uh, and and there's more that you haven't shown right uh, there's a finite amount of time and the success has been great um, but what are what are a couple maybe choose your top three uh, either phenomena processes uh, where the current computationally feasible scales cannot get the reality or maybe we don't understand the processes well enough uh, choose your top three yeah I think I think it's a combination of of both it's not just resolution I think uh, and it's not even just complexity and it's not just even a question of capturing the complexity there are knowledge gaps and you know the principal one I can think of is the whole aerosol cloud uh, interactions as well as cloud feedbacks we still are uh, not understanding uh, you know are we we still don't know really whether we are doing the cloud problem uh, or how good are we doing the cloud problem because there are now multiple lines of evidence uh, which show that the models in many respects are not capturing the climate cloud interactions very well because now you have a lot of observations and you can test these models much better than you know you could do it 10 years ago and there's a lot of lines of evidence emerging that we haven't caught on to the cloud problem so i would I would think I would say that the cl the cloud climate and the you know the climate sensitivity aspects resulting from it are one thing that we we still have knowledge gaps. It's not just more observations or increasing computer resolution. We still have knowledge gaps. Uh, I mean, one of the things there is really the entrainment of dry air into a convective into into convection and into clouds formed by convection. You know how well can be represented because it's happening at much smaller scales then we can hope to capture i mean it's one even one kilometer may not be enough you have to go to maybe sub kilometer scales so that's one thing i mean you said top three um the i i think the the other thing i would mention is not necessarily a total failure but it is whether we can capture the um you know things like internal variability of things like you know when when is it when you're going to get to do real el nino predictions for example uh, I would think that that is a, I mean, we can, we can try to understand El Nino through models, but to actually predict it, that like, next year, you know, there'll be an El Nino or the following year, there'll be a La Nina. That's the kind of thing that, you know, we still haven't uh, grappled with. I think uh, well, some of those things, especially on the timescales of, you know, sub-season to interannual, even up to decadal, also relies on data simulation. So that's an important activity along with just model development. It is how good are you assimilating, how well are you assimilating the data? And we have found a lot of sensitivity to just, you know, prediction of El Nino's because of kind of how much data you ingest or you absorb in the model. So I, I, that's not a total failure, but I think it is kind of still a, something that we have to work on. Um, I mean, the third thing that um, is, what would, what would I call a failure? Um, I don't know what a third thing or failure. Well, maybe an opportunity, a, a present <laughs> success. No, it's nice to think of failures because um, the third opportunity is uh, really the uh, you know getting down to uh, regional scales in terms of precipitation. Uh, you know, temperatures kind of are homogeneous over a broad expanse, so temperatures is kind of as not that much a chronic problem, but I think precipitation is. And here, you know, um, how to get from the resolutions that we can actually afford to run climate models to scales that are much smaller than that where people live. And so extremes matter, extremes in precipitation matter. How do we get there? And there are some interesting ideas uh, in the community, you know, for example, using machine learning techniques to kind of take the, take us uh, to, to represent convection, for example. You know, we, that's, that's the most uncertain part of the convection clouds uh, precipitation story. So can you represent convection very nicely by uh, deep learning? Um, 
can you proceed there? That's a, still a question mark, I think, but it is it is a failure. I think the not being able to do precipitation is a sort of failure, but it's also an opportunity because there are techniques now they can adopt to some somewhat bypass the resolution issue and see if you can actually capitalize on uh, pattern recognition and applying it uh, in some ways to improve upon precipitation, especially extremes. So extremes is kind of really something that um, we should be able to predict much better. Uh, I mean, right now, what you're kind of seeing is analysis of all the events in the past, but going forward into the future, I think we should be able to, we should be able to test against more extremes and seeing, seeing sort of uh, what the model does. Good. So uh, we have a, a couple of questions here. Um, Alan and Ilya uh, are asking, um, of course, you showed a lot of things, but there's always more that you could have shown. And uh, so there's uh, some questions regarding, uh, first off, the, the stratosphere, um, and in particular, uh, volcanic eruptions and the simulation of the, 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 the whole system response to volcanic eruptions. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Or Yeah, sure. Um, there are a lot of gaps. So, you know, on the, especially the, uh, I mean, like all other modeling centers, we also have done simulations involving volcanic eruptions, but where you do, what you do there is you kind of take the, uh, you know, the optical depths from satellite observations, then put in the model and then capture what the aerosols are doing, stratospheric aerosols are doing to the climate system. So, I mean, that, that is a, that's kind of something which, which went on for 20 years. But I think what is more important is actually doing the whole thing self-consistently, where you actually start from the plumes, sulfur plumes that come out from the volcano, and then let it do the chemistry and the aerosol microphysics and evolve and be transported. That um, has not happened yet in our model, but it's actually something that people at GFTL are currently working on. Uh, so that is happening, in fact, putting in a, entire stratospheric chemistry module into the uh, into the earth system model to be able to do the stratosphere. So, it, so it's happening, it's uh, in our model right now. I know that other modeling centers kind of have done, have done this in the past. Uh, so what is the other part of it? Uh, so on the volcanic eruptions, yeah, there's something, some work going on, not yet manifest. Um, yeah. uh, so I, I think that was, those that gets okay. to the questions um, on that one. So uh, we had another question. Um, and I think this touches on uh, sort of ongoing research opportunities. Uh, and I, I'm going to rephrase the question and put it in, in, a, in a positive frame. Uh, Stephen Gill asks, um, essentially, uh, there's, there's some question here, there's some question about uh, both the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheets um, and, and, and some concern about their future. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say about First off, the, the challenges in modeling the ice sheets and then the, the opportunities to know them better and then maybe something about where our understanding sits at the moment. Yeah, I assume that this is a question about the land ice sheets. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, on the, I mean, on the, let me take the Antarctic ice sheet, which is kind of something that everyone desperately wants to know how, how we can predict it. And one of the things, development that has happened, especially with the new MOM6 ocean model, the modular, modular ocean model version six, um, is that it is actually allowing, enabling the interactions between um, ice sheets and oceans, not just at the surface, but also kind of deep inside uh, where the margins are and the interactions between them uh, are being getting simulated. Um, we still have a, a, a sort of a, a role in terms of actually coupling the knowledge that we have of the land ice sheets, its dynamics, its physics, to the full ocean and to actually study the interaction. So Antarctic ice sheet, it's coming along, you know, it's something that is still not uh, totally interactive uh, with the global climate model. Uh, but, it, you know, all the details uh, that are concerned, the physics and dynamics of the ice sheets, uh, of Antarctic ice sheet is being captured. Um, on the Greenland ice sheet, I think there are a lot of uh, questions that still uh, are, are circulating about the interaction between the ocean currents uh, and the uh, the ice sheet, and, and you know, so one one is at the sort of where the inter where they intersect, the interface between the ice sheet and the uh, uh, and and the ocean, and the other one, which is something uh, you know you, we can we know from observations is happening, but there aren't 
really enough clues as to uh, how to do the modeling of it, which is things happening inside these uh, ice sheets, inside the green ice sheet, where you know you have these uh, big like water drainages going on inside the ice sheet. Uh, it, it's very evident from observations, but you know how do you how how do you understand it, and then how do you uh, actually formulate uh, what's happening there? Because yeah, the, now they are they're finding these big tunnels of uh, water draining beneath beneath the surface of the ice. So that's I mean that is still an enigma. I don't think we have uh, we have to scratch more than the surface to reach uh, that phenomenon. So um, I see a question here from Kim Peterson. Hey Kim, um, uh, are there uh, so are there any rules of thumbs for places in the world? Uh, where uh, the representation is lagging. Uh, and so they may have systematically higher uncertainty than other places, for example, or extremely mountainous regions, or are there uh, unusual types of terrains that, that, that remain sort of uh, more challenging right now? I mean, certainly regions with the high mountains are, are a challenge because uh, uh, you, you kind of, don't have the resolution in most in most of these high places to simulate the topography very well, which affects the air circulation and therefore things like precipitation. In terms of you know other places going away from orographic places, I think the tropics are uh, are, are still um, and especially again in terms of extremes uh, like extreme precipitation tropics are still something that we have to get a better handle on. Um, uh, and it, it probably does. It probably does go back to the you know the cliched uh, convection clouds uh, issue, but uh, it could be more than that. I mean, it could be how uh, are we doing sort of the circulations? Um, I mean, are, they, are we capturing them sufficiently well that we can do the extremes? I think we get the mean climate, uh, some you know pretty pretty good. I mean, mean climate is not uh, that difficult anymore. In, in a lot of places, but extremes in those same places, uh, anomalies from that from the means are are still problematic, and tropics, you know, with the changes in climate, especially you know changes in, for example, the Hadley cell circulation, um, you know, are, are they? Are, are, I think that we still have a lot of uh, things to work out in terms of the extremes in those regions. So even not going to non-orographic regions, I think that's still an issue there. So uh, we have a going, you, you, you raised the issue about simulating the tropics and uh, uh, one, of, one of the challenging areas, one of the most interesting areas is I think in both of our opinions are, are monsoonal regions and uh, Saverio Berri asks um, that on slide 25, if you recall, that was I believe the, the prediction of hurricanes or, or that, that Murakami et al. studied, mm -hmm. that there was slight discrepancy in, in the Bay of Bengal and Arabian yeah. Sea. And, um, and, and uh, he was wondering to what extent uh, is the, the model's monsoonal circulation and, and the ventilation effect that, it, uh, that, that affects hurricanes in the Arabian Sea captured or uh, is, uh, is, is simulating the monsoon um, still sufficiently limited that, that some of those results may be inhibited? Yes, the answer is yes. I mean, that's that's a good observation that the Indian Ocean, uh, Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea uh, storms are actually not captured, uh, as well as let's say the Atlantic storms and and the Pacific storms. Um, I, I think you know hurricanes being sort of uh, an, an extreme. I think it has to do with how well we are doing the uh, extremes over India, uh, and over the actually broadly over India and the Asian region, but really the, the South Asian region. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, got, it's got to do with some uh, physics that, has, that needs to improvement there to be able to capture these, uh, these storms. I mean, uh, I didn't show the surface temperature, for example, the Indian Ocean, that also um, is not as, uh, no, not as, not captured as well as in other parts of the globe. So then, there's something happening with the anomalies. I think again, you know, models are uh, when they kind of when when models are developed. I think there's a lot of good optimization to get the mean climate. So you know, mean climate kind of by default is. Uh, I mean, it better be good, otherwise the model is not going to be good at all. But the extremes, 
in in that part of the world are still a problem um some of it maybe topography but i think with the the high resolution models also uh do not get rid of all the you know all the deficiencies that you see in the coarse resolution models so there's something else in the physics i mean the whole for example i mean when they talk about the monsoon onset and then you know the, uh, there's a phase where there's actually no monsoon i mean it completely stops and then picks up again uh, those kind of phases are are, are not captured uh, in in these models um yeah yeah i'll, I'll leave it there I, i don't know much more about how to solve that problem right now <laughs> no i i would i would just echo this it, it so for for those of you listening and interested in the future of climate science the indian ocean is a fascinating place to study it's four different oceans at different times of the year uh directly impacts billions of people um so if you're interested for something cool to study that's a place now i'll finish here with a final question or maybe because i see mike uh arriving um it's one that speaks to something i care about a lot so rob sokolo asks uh what sort of what's a coordination uh to what level is there coordination between observational campaigns say argo satellites the mood boy array and model development is is the synergy there and is there is there more synergy to be had oh definitely i think the, the last part is always true more synergy can can always be had and and can be good there is actually a lot of synergy now i mean the argo for example uh, data is uh, very i mean there's a very uh, uh, large contact in terms of the people who collect argo data and those who are using it Uh, to do predictions for example so we use it um, uh, with the satellite community also there's a lot of interactions maybe not in every phase of you know the satellite interactions but certainly on things that are of deep interest uh, and deep relevance to climate such as uh, the radiation budget the uh, aerosol the chemistry um, the sort of altimetry uh, you know uh, measurements uh, so there's a there's a lot of interaction um i think there's a, also a lot of inputs that go on with the satellite community in this case uh, nasa uh, was, uh, wants to send up satellites and they involve a lot of modeling community so so we get involved in that uh there's also a lot of interaction uh that goes on with the forecast community which is you know on the, on the noaa side is a satellite service NES, nesdis so in terms of operational satellites um there's an interaction because now that NOAA has this new model with the FV3 Dicor they are starting a new simulation system and so for that simulation system they require um, you know modelers to sit in and so that there also the modeling community as a whole um, gathers inputs and of course you know the observations shape a lot of the model developments i mean if i go back to 2013 when we had the third generation models between that and the fourth generation there was a lot of emphasis on how we can get to match the observations better uh, i showed the example of precipitation that was directly due to um, absorbing in the lessons from whatever the satellite data revealed as problems in the previous generation models and so that was heavily used in the construction of the next generation models going forward it's going to be even more so already you know in the context of cmip6 which is going on right now that's a couple model into comparison project which is run by the world climate research program as well as the results that are going to come out in ipcc ar6 the working group one report is going to be out this year uh, you can see such a heavy use of observations so much so that uh, if observations say something that the models don't say uh, right now that's a line of evidence to show that models are not right are wrong previously there was a heavy dependence on models now observations and that then shapes how the models are going to use that information for future modeling that's a learning process it goes on all the time well i hate to interrupt this i know this is uh, for me a totally fascinating uh, discussion but i know gabe has to teach at 1:30 and i see it's 1:31 thank you gabe <laughs> i appreciate it um, thanks gabe and uh, i also on behalf of uh, everyone at the institute and everyone uh, uh, listening ram thank you for a terrific presentation um really interesting discussion afterward i'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions um but i think we got to many of them uh and uh well thank you for just a, a terrific presentation ron thanks mike thanks a lot and thanks to everyone for listening in and the questions really enjoyed them excellent okay, okay. uh so uh to remind everyone we'll be back again um uh, next month april 6th we'll hear from alison caruth 
talking about how we communicate climate change. Uh, so a, a very nice follow up to what we heard today. And then on May 4th, Reed Maxwell will be talking about uh, uh, water issues across the continental United States. So we look forward to seeing you April 6th. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Be well.